while a US-based company called Leo Labs, which tracks space junk and debris, is building radar stations in Western Australia. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good afternoon. Why Western Australia? Yeah, Western Australia is a great place for what they're trying to do for tracking space junk because you get good coverage, obviously, by being in the south, so the latitude, but longitude, it's in a good position where you're getting a lot of good uh, traction, uh, uh, looking at orbits, launches from Asia. And when we say Asia, we you know, India launches, China launches a lot, uh, and, you know, and other countries are coming up quite quickly, Japan, Korea. So it's a great place to cover that area. So you have this huge hole in terms of coverage in Western Australia fills that void, in addition just to being uh, lots of land without lots of radio interference, which is the key for tracking radar. You don't want a lot of radio interference from mobile phones and that sort of thing. And also great news for, for jobs in Australia because Leo Labs is looking at recruiting here as well. Yeah, you know, and this is the sort of thing that we're really starting to see now that space has become a big thing in Australia. It's not just Australian investment or the government or companies. Lots of these overseas partners are saying, hey, look, you know, kind of Australia is open for business. We need the help. We need the resources. We need the people. Uh, so we will always have this great geographical advantage for where we sit in the world and the fact that we just have so much land that doesn't have radio pollution. You can't put these things easily in Europe or the U.S. because of all of the people and mobile phone towers and all that sort of stuff. So Australia, just for our long expertise in radio astronomy, means it's going to be a bigger and bigger area as we see this whole tracking uh, and monitoring things in space, space traffic control, essentially. Yeah, terrific news. And uh, absolutely, we're certainly at an advantage where we are, Brad. Now, South Korea has launched its first homegrown space rocket. They're calling it Nuri. I believe that's how we pronounce it. Yeah. Is this South Korea's first foray into space? So South Korea, you know, they're known for being obviously a technological powerhouse. They haven't as been as big in space. And when we say space, really launching and putting things up to say some of their neighbours. China, obviously, India, Japan. Now, they have had a few attempts at rocket launches before, but those rockets didn't reach space. Uh, so they tried in the late 2000s, I think 2009 and 2010, those rockets didn't reach space. Uh, Nuri, as you said, uh, did reach orbit. So it did reach its height that it was aiming for. Now, it didn't perfectly go to plan. They were trying to test putting a satellite in orbit. That's the key, not just taking something up, but putting it in the right spot. They did all of that except ending up in the right spot. Now, that's not a surprise. It's really hard to nail it on one of your first attempts. Every company and country has issues. But they made a big step in that right direction, really trying to show that they can do it as, as a homegrown industry, essentially, not just relying on their satellites going on another country, but doing it themselves. And what does what is South Korea aiming to use Nuri for? So, you know, look, when you when you have this ability, you can put any of your own equipment into space. Now, this could be satellites for monitoring weather. It obviously can be for defense uses, looking at satellites uh, and, and operations for communication, monitoring on the ground. Obviously, we know between South Korea and North Korea, there's always that tension. And look, the same technology that goes into putting a satellite into orbit is essentially the same thing that you can use for uh, a ballistic missile. Now, we've seen North Korea doing this as well, where they're saying, oh, well, they're just launching a satellite, but you clearly know there's probably some other uses that you can have. So it, there's a little bit impetus for South Korea to be this independent to make sure that they kind of keep up not just with Japan and China and India, but obviously their neighbours to the north. Yeah, you certainly wonder what uh, North Korea thinks uh, of yeah. the space rocket. So, yeah, interesting. Watch that space. Uh, yes. Now, Brad, assembly is underway for NASA's spaceship and a rocket that will go to the moon next year. Yeah, you know, this is going to be the first of Artemis. So this is NASA's return to the moon mission. Uh, so this will be the first launch that goes to the moon. Now, it will not, not take people and it won't land on the moon. It will just go around it kind of as a first test. In order to get this to work, they will use the Orion capsule. Now, that's the thing that the humans and satellites will sit in, as you're seeing right now. Uh, and that will be attached to the space launch system. That is the giant rocket that NASA will use. And so they've just put those two bits together. They've mounted the capsule where the humans will go into and to the rocket. So really getting that assembly ready for a launch next year. And it's amazing to think that, you know, we've been building this and wondering when is this all going to happen? And well, now 
it's only a few months but away before that first rocket goes to the moon uh, as part of this ambitious plan uh, with the aim to get humans there uh, in 2024. Yeah, it's very exciting, and uh, obviously they've got to get it right, Brad. We That's can't right. have any errors with something like this. So exactly. uh, good to hear, good to hear. Now, astronomers have found an old star switching on and off. Uh, when you think of that, is it literally like flicking off? It's almost like a light switch, Brad? Kind of, yeah, um, <laughs> and, and at a very quick rate. This is why it's surprising, because it's not millions of years or billions of years. Sometimes it's turning on in the span of hours, like someone's really playing a trick with the light. So as a white dwarf, this is something our sun will be in five billion years, a very old star. Well, when it gets near a neighboring star, something in its solar system, it can actually use its gravity to kind of suck off material like a vacuum. And as it does, it kind of ignites this. And it does this, we usually thought on the order of years, thousands of years sometimes, or a little bit longer. But with TESS, the telescope you just saw, which monitors the sky sometimes every two minutes, usually just every 30 minutes, it was able to see this flickering on and off, this really burst of light or this suctioning on the scale of minutes. So really getting a new glimpse into how stars in the system interact. So how do the, the binary companions, as we say, how do the partners really feel about this whole situation? So it's not a rare phenomenon as such. So we don't think it's a rare phenomenon. It's just the first time we've ever seen this on, a, on an order we just never thought, you know, exists. And this is kind of the amazing thing when we build these satellites. We look at things that we think, oh, well, we know how often that happens or how exactly it does. And then all of a sudden it's like saying, hey, oh, OK, I know the lights are on, but no, actually someone's just sitting there flicking it on and off for us. Yeah, that's how I imagined it uh, in my head as well. So it's good to know that I'm on that same page. That's right. Brad, Brad Tucker, good to chat to you. Thank you for joining me. Take care.